We'll start perhaps with the most obvious consensus name here of this whole list, maybe of the whole market, and it's Apple. Evercore naming it a top pick for next year. Interesting, they call it that the roaring 20s they see continuing for tech. They see sustained upside for the iPhone and surfaces and wearables. It's still just below that $3 trillion threshold of 30% this year. Chris, are you a buyer? I, I'm not, Kelly, and thanks for having me back again. Uh, you know, it's just such a consensus pick. I, I, I don't get this one compared to the alternatives in the FANG universe. I mean, Apple is supposed to grow earnings about 8% next year. And it's selling for 28 times those earnings. A stock like Google, for example, is going to grow twice that rate and is selling at 22 times. Or Facebook, again, twice the rate and selling at 21 times. So people forget that iPhones have good years and bad years. And if they have a bad year, as recently as early 2019, Apple sold at only 11 times earnings. So, you know, there's a lot of potential downside and there's more upside in other names. All right. I can't believe you're willing to go on the record with that. Simo, uh, what would you add? Listen, I think, Kelly, the valuation argument will be uh, valid given the outperformance in the stock this year. There is, though, an overwhelming number of analysts who are bullish on the stock. We're talking about 33 buys, eight holes, and just one sell rating. I guess the question is, what takes this stock even higher? Is it the AR, VR headset? Headset does Apple's experience in the wearables category give it an edge over a company like Meta or simply its sheer size with 150,000 employees and not to mention a lot of cash? Does that make its rate of success much higher than some of the other companies that are trying to tackle this metaverse? Space? Chris, actually, I just wanted to circle back to you for a second. If sure. Apple, you know, and you mentioned some of its uh, peers, who, if we were to say, okay, just within tech, what would your top pick be for 2022? What's yours? I would mention those two names I did before, Google and Facebook. I'd also add, look, who's the marginal buyer for Apple? Isn't everybody already on board? So that, that's a much <laughs> tougher game to play. Then there's lots of controversy around Facebook and some around Google. And, and that actually gives opportunity on the upside when those things are resolved. All right. Delano, where are you on them? Yeah, Kelly, I'm definitely a holder here, and I look for opportunities to buy uh, when the stock dips, and I think the valuation point is valid. We're seeing stretch valuations as the stock pushes to that $3 trillion mark, but I do think, as Seema mentioned, they are making bets in other areas. You're talking about wearables. You're talking about their service businesses, their subscription revenue, which is growing to the upside. So I think that, you know, holders here want to hold on and look out to 2022 because there are some opportunities. There may be some more opportunities for buying uh, on any dips. All righty, we'll leave it there and we'll move along to maybe the second most obvious name, which is Chipotle. Goldman naming it a top restaurant pick, liking its strong digital moats and free cash flow. Chipotle net sales grows, uh, grow 20%, I should say, in the third quarter, including an 8% jump in digital sales. And this company has added more than 24 million members to its loyalty program in just two and a half years. The shares are down 15% from the 52-week high, but they're still up 20% this year, Seema. It... You know, again, I'm joking a little bit about some of these being obvious because they're only obvious until they're not. Or to right. Chris's point, if they're too obvious, then there's no kind of room for performance left sometimes. No, it's a great point. And last time, Kelly, the CEO, Brian Nickel, joined us on CNBC in mid-November. He talked about the, the threat of the labor shortage, but, ha but also pointed out how that's, it's accelerated Chipotle's uh, investment in digital, which we know was one of its key sort of success stories within the pandemic, how it allowed Chipotle to outperform. And also in this report from Morgan Stanley, the survey finds that this is a company within the quick service space that has a higher proportion of mid to high income consumers that can, can uh, deal with higher prices if prices are continuing to rise in 2022. It's got that target consumer. All right, Delano? No, I definitely think there's still some more upside for Chipotle. And I think they're looking at the consumer. Everyone's talking about the bifurcation. I do still think we have to consider that there has been wage increases across the board, obviously. And there also is an area where consumers have the most they've had in savings. I think that spending will continue out into 2022. We've mentioned the labor and input cost pressures. That's still going to be a, a, a point of contention. But, you know, Chipotle has a brand where they can pass that on to consumers. And the big thing that I like is a digital ecosystem where they're driving up that membership loyalty. The stock has taken a little bit of a dip, so there might be an opportunity for a buy here. All right, Chris, are you swimming with the tide on this one or against it? No, no, I'm swimming with the tide here. And, and the only thing that those smart folks haven't mentioned is inflation. I mean, inflation is good for the restaurant business as long as they can control the input costs. And I think Chipotle can do that pretty well. So remember, earnings are nominal and inflation will push those earnings a higher. And so I, I like Chipotle a lot. All right. We've done, uh, let's see, where do we start? Apple, that's right. We've done Chipotle. Let's do some media now. Uh, for the slightly less obvious, how about Disney? It's been a laggard this year. It's down more than 15 percent. 
Morgan Stanley just naming it a top idea with 20% upside from here. Delano, is Disney going to get its mojo back? Yeah, I think the one area where we can see if they will get the mojo back is obviously we're looking at the themes uh, and parks area side of the business. Disney Plus, we've obviously seen that side of the business grow and direct to consumer content is going to grow. I think they have to bring more original content to the table. Uh, but as an investor and a holder of Disney uh, that hasn't been buying as of late, I'm looking to see what happens with the theme, themes and parks side of the business, which, as we mentioned, is going to be a big contingent on what happens with the variants and uh, the different variants that are uh, popping up. And so, you know, I think there's still a little bit more to consider on the business side of there, but um, I'm still going to be a holder here for Disney. All right, Chris, what about you? Well, I, I got to tell you, Kelly, this is my rapid fire favorite today <laughs> because Disney <laughs> Disney is going to win in two different ways. They've gotten slammed this year. I think it's a real opportunity. It's a, obviously a reopening stock. Don't forget, the last 10% of capacity at the parks is by far the most profitable. Those parks have enormous fixed costs. So hmm. once you totally fill them up, which I think will happen by the end of this year, that's amazingly profitable. Plus, on the, the second way they win is Disney Plus. It's having a kind of mediocre this year, year this year because the compares of last year with the pandemic are so difficult. But content will win out at the end. And I think Disney is second to none in content. So that, I, I think it's a real win and a real opportunity. Chris, the one thing I wonder sometimes for both Netflix and Disney when people say, okay, it's been a good content year, it's been a bad one, but content is really expensive. Everybody wants the best content. So I think it more raises the question of how much does Disney have to spend in order to maintain that pipeline of premier content? Well... I think Netflix is much worse off in that regard because so many of those things are out of Netflix control. They'll buy names to put on besides the things they create. But Disney is creating internally Star Wars and Pixar, and they have spent that money and now can reap the benefits of that. The other thing here is that Disney's Disney Plus is relatively inexpensive, and Disney, like they have at the parks for decades, can raise prices each year and still make a great return that way. Yeah. So I, th I think there's a few levers they can pull. Seema? Uh, Kelly, this is a media and entertainment company, but it's also a company that really relies on travel. And I can tell you the latest traffic trends suggest that bookings are down because of the Omicron variant. So you got to wonder what that means for the theme park business. Uh, you know, the expectation that it get back to 2019 levels. Does that get pushed out even more? And also, we should point out, this is a stock that is not only down a lot from its 52-week high, we are looking at the worst performer on the Dow wow. in 2021. Uh, but interestingly enough, Wall Street says this could be a good pick for next year. Yeah, so unlike Apple and Chipotle, this one is an underperformer that people think will shine. We'll leave it there and move along to our final and least obvious pick for 2022. It's the consumer staples. Goldman says they're poised to rally after a quiet 2021. They say investors will grow to appreciate their predictable revenue stream. Staples are up just 11 percent this year. That's just half for the S&P, uh, S&P's performance. It's top picks in the space, P&G, Constellation, Mondelez, Olaplex. I keep thinking about that, for my hair, and Monster. <laughs> Staples are already picking up steam. In fact, they're the best performer on the S&P this month. And Tootsie Roll, believe it or not, Tootsie Roll is the sector standout so far in December. Delano, what would you do with Staples? I am thinking about Olaplex for my hair as well, Kelly. Um, I think <laughs> right now I'm looking at it from a standpoint of I want an area where there's more growth. And the, the others you mentioned are more incumbents, and Olaplex is kind of a disruptor in the space, in the health and beauty space. And I think that's a big part of, of, of actually looking at it from that standpoint as well. And if you look at their sales channel, they do a great job with the hairs and salons, which is important. They also drive social media engagement. Their sales growth in the top line for newly IPO companies is important to watch, and I've been watching, and that's obviously growing. And they're also spinning off cash. Their margins are pretty high as well, which is important for a growing business to be able to meet demand. So I like Olaplex here, Kelly. I'll be curious, Seema, how this whole sector does with the Fed this week, if they are raising rates, where bond yields go, you know, is that a help or a hurt? Yeah, and what that means for inflation as well. I just spoke to, Kelly, uh, the president of Pernod Record, which uh, of course has a, a portfolio of different spirits and liquor sales. And they were saying that despite uh, inflation going up, rates going up next year, they think demand for their premium brands will continue to remain high because that customer has gotten so comfortable, so um, appealed to these type of brands that they think that doesn't go away. Maybe that bodes well for the broader consumer staple space.